everyone of the viewers to this uh, uh, third edition of the conversations that we are having about the next stage of Kerala, the post-COVID Kerala. As we all know, the world is going through an unprecedented situation over the past few months. This is expected to make major changes in the way we go about life. ASAP has already made an impact in the skilling landscape of Kerala with their various initiatives, including the community skill parks. The series of discussions is supported by Norca Roots, the nodal agency that ensures the welfare and well-being of non-resident Keralites. Norca Roots also play an active role in profiling and providing employment and entrepreneurship opportunities to the returning Keralites. The media partner for this series of conversations is Madhubhumi. We are grateful to Norca Roots, ASAP and Madhubhumi for this initiative. Uh, we have the Honorable Finance Minister of uh, Kerala, Dr. Thomas Isaac, who will be joining the conversation uh, shortly. He's having some challenges, so that he's slightly delayed. So we have a series of eminent panelists here. Uh, so I will begin with Professor Santosh Merotra, Professor of Economics at Jawaharlal Nehru University, a human development economist, whose research and writings have had most influence in the areas of labor, employment, skill development, child poverty, and the economics of education. He was an economic advisor in the United Nations system in New York, Italy, and Thailand, and a technocrat in the government of India during 2006 to 2014 period. So Professor Merotra brings a combination of professional experience with the Indian government as a policymaker and advisor, and with international organizations as a technical expert. So my first question to you is, what do you think would be the main developmental challenges that Kerala will face in the immediate future in the areas of jobs and skilling, given the context of the burgeoning number of educated job seekers here and a large number of non-resident Keralites, especially from the Middle East, coming back here? Right. Uh, Professor Meruta. Thank you. Uh, when I was looking at the data for uh, Kerala, what uh, struck me was, uh, and it didn't surprise me, but what surprised me was the extent of unemployment, particularly for youth. You know, what's, what's uh, remarkable is that between 2004, 5 and 11, 12, the NSS data tells us that um, unemployment was pretty stable or in fact even declining, including for youth uh, in Kerala, um, it went, went down from 28% to 21%, uh, of course, which is much higher than the rest of India. But the point is it shot up by 2017-18 to 36% for youth, when the national rate had also tripled to 18%. And uh, the government agency, Norka Roots, that you were just men mentioning, Mr. Subhash, uh, apparently has noted that there are almost 4 million rep repatriates now in Kerala and, uh, and Kerala is expecting another half million. Sir, just a minute, sir. I think the uh, minister has just got connected. Uh, can I go to him and come back to you, sir? Of course. Professor Miracle? Yes. Thank you. No problem. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, yeah. And uh, uh, welcome to this show. Uh, so I, we had just started off the conversation uh, <laughs> since you had a challenge in getting connected. Um, uh, to the viewers, uh, complete. Uh, we are really happy that uh, Dr. Thomas Isaac, the Honorable Minister of Finance for the Government of Kerala is here. Uh, Dr. Thomas Isaac is a well-respected public intellectual, author and economist, globally recognized as the author of the much acclaimed People's Planning Program of Kerala. So one of the major challenges having as a custodian of the public finances of the state <clears throat> is allocation of the available resources, which in itself are dwindling. And at the same time, we are entering an era where we will need more of government in many areas. The wage bill as a percentage of expenses of government is high and will probably increase as government initiates more and more economic and social programs. While that is the reality, 
we have a significant number of government employees in legacy roles uh, doing a set of tasks which require only a small fraction of the number if appropriate technology and workflow processes are applied. And on the other hand, there are many areas within the government, for example, uh, civic services, where there are shortages of people. Uh, what are your thoughts on reskilling and repurposing the workforce within the government to meet the needs and expectations of tomorrow's Kerala? Yes. <clears throat> now, how much time can I take? You can take about uh, seven to eight minutes, sir. Okay. Addressing the question you raised. Yes, sir. Or okay. you could come to that. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, this is going to be extremely bad year for Kerala. I expect our state GDP to shrink by 15 percent. That's a big shrinkage. I don't think Kerala would have contracted to that test at any time in history. Now that's one. So by the time we want to restart, many of your MSME sector uh, units uh, who need a hell of a lot of help to get them going. That's one challenge. Secondly, you are going to have a big return migration of a scale much larger than the Kuwaiti crisis. I think minimum you should expect, not family members, some five lakh people to lose their jobs and come back. Minimum, that's the minimum. Now, these are the two challenges. And just as you said, this is a time when you need not less government, but more government. That's accepted now universally by everybody. But to have a larger government, you need more money. And government revenues are going to be at least 35,000 crores less than budget. That's uh, something like 25% of the expected revenue of the current year. So state is facing a big fiscal crisis. Then how do you address the challenge? That's whatever we are skilling you. But whatever you want to do, without money you cannot do that. <clears throat> Now, on the one hand, you will have to set the government mission. You know, I think you addressed the right question. You raised the right, right question. Um, there need to be very significant redeployment in the government workforce. In the sense, there are areas you need much more government employees, for example, local government. Local governments have been the fulcrum around which the entire, let's say, anti-pandemic anti activities have been going on in Kerala. And now it has been running by uh, volunteers and so on, but you have to institutionalize it. So now everybody accepts. What of redeployment has got to take place there. Secondly, our health sector is going to increase. Okay. And that increase that which is taking place now will likely to continue into the future to a great test. That's the second place. And um, now hand holding the MSME sector, skilling them and so on requires some um, more employees in those sectors. Now, our higher, edu higher education needs a big uplift. Now, just imagine, next year, no student from Kerala will be going to other states to study. <laughs> On the other hand, all of them are coming back, and the students would like to continue their education. I mean, you have to better think about this. 
for example, this raises the workload of teachers. Okay. There are certain norms which have come, which have, have I don't find the, um, understand uh, the rationale for it. I think everybody has to openly think this is a new situation. You cannot, cannot, cannot just cling on to what you have been used to. Okay, I don't want to go into details of this, but I agree with you. This is something which has to be taken up seriously. Now, I think outside the budget, because the, within the budget, I, my hands are tied to what central government in his dispensation wants to permit me to do. And therefore, we have been always, we have already started thinking how to leverage from outside the budget the funds. And you have KIFP, which is a, a unique institution, I say, in India, uh, which is similarly successful. Um, we will have to have such financial institutions. You have Kerala Bank, you have got KFC, KSFE. I give a central role to these financial institutions, which are not part of the government. But the government can direct them because they are going to play a key role in financing uh, whatever we want to do. Now, just now, today, we are starting online education. Okay. Now, this is disruptive. <laughs> disruptive technology, I should say. Um, a lot of people are very upset. You know, <coughs> interface between teachers, students, etc. I understand the importance of it. But you have a choice. <laughs> But then comes uh, the challenge. Uh, one, how to use this technology, all right, effectively. Um, we have thought of say public, uh, say telecast. Then you have internet. Uh, then you can should have local level cables to be utilized. The WhatsApp groups at the local level, and so on. It's not just one technology; it's a bunch of uh, technological interventions that are good with. Just look at one new line of activity, how much, how many more skills you require at the local level from teachers and everybody who are involved. And it requires money. Now look here, I'm just leveraging KSFE, Kerala State Financial Institutions, who is going to distribute finance uh, uh, purchase of about uh, two lakh laptops to anybody is willing to, wanting, I mean, wants it. And they need to have the money with them. KSFE will arrange the money. Now that means they will have to raise the resources. Now how does KSFE raise the resources? KSFE went to NABAR, financial institutions, because um, anyway, MSME and non-banking financial institutions were to get a lot of money from the central stimulus package. And they all said no. And they demand 8.5% interest for a lending institution. At what rate you can lend? So, what we have done, we have just done one simple thing. Just raise the interest rates for deposits in KSFE by 1%. KSFE will borrow at 8.5. Now, that 8.5 doesn't go to some bank. It goes to, say, uh, retired people in Kerala. Good enough. And KSFE will lend at a low, lower margin. So it is going to resource, raise resources on the saving of the people in Kerala itself by offering a rate which they would have to pay to the bank, which these people will get uh, if they are going to deposit in a bank. And then finance this laptop. <laughs> this is precisely what we are going to do. So to respond to your question, my more hope lie outside the budget, how cleverly and you can innovatively, you can use your financial institution. And within the budget, there will have to be a um, reordering of the budget and also the plan. And I will stop with this, just saying the priorities there. One, <coughs> I think health related activities, pharmaceuticals, as well as, uh, say, uh, medical devices. Uh, those parts must come up. And skilling, in the budget I said 10,000 nurses. Now I'm 
enlarging is 25000 nurses paramedics kerala health brand is so good we should very actively prepare for the post pandemic times for the demand that will rise we should be willing to supply kerala nurses and kerala medical personnel all over you see in fact we should start thinking in that line um we and building that kerala brand so that this people get job so now same training 25000 nurses in the coming six month period in different languages the health protocols in those different countries and getting to talk with them is yeah you know everybody wants to listen to kerala you know how many people are calling me up for a talk and so so talk to those governments get in touch with them tell them that we are willing to supply trained persons in the language and so on so this is one uh tourism it and even say agro processing industries that's what chief minister has said it requires new technology yeah? it is not traditional technology it means transferring new skills to normal workers i will stop here for example hey, yes Yeah, I'll stop. Yeah. Here. Thank you, sir. I think so. Now, minutes and more. I think. Another very interesting and uh, great to see your uh, you know innovative thinking and insights into how to deal with that. i will uh, go back to uh, professor merotra uh, uh, sir you had uh, uh, sorry when i had interrupted you you were talking about how uh, the services uh, jobs in services in kerala is about 40% whereas the revenue is around 70% so would you please continue on from there right, right. um so what i think we need to remind ourselves is that although in the economy as a whole in in india uh, jobs have not been growing since 2012 so uh, your, so your videos have go, has gone, gone off <laughs> apologies so uh, what i was saying was that all across india uh, joblessness has increased unemployment rates have increased and of course youth unemployment particularly had tripled across the country but youth unemployment had tripled to about 18% in the rest of the country but in kerala it's 36% so that's truly truly worrying and i i was sort of taken aback when i saw when i was looking at the numbers today i'm talking about specifically of 15 to 29 year olds so in this context i think it's absolutely critical that we begin thinking about um the employability of youth and the employability of youth you know raises uh, the 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 following question um apparently uh, about 45% of um those in tertiary education or and even at the higher secondary level are in arts science and commerce streams and they have no industry relevant skills at all apparently in kerala i have this information from the from the higher education department and of course they are lacking in soft skills like language and 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 so on and th- this is particularly problematic because uh, in the country as a whole you know the jobs uh, that are growing are in the modern services sector and clearly if modern serv- if services account for a significant proportion of total kerala employment it, there's some potential for increase there but the interesting thing is that in the country a very very tiny proportion and i'm sure this is the case in kerala also very tiny proportion of all secondary and higher secondary students are in vocational courses believe it or not the the nss of 2017 18 told us that only 2.4% of indian uh, uh, workforce is formally trained it couldn't be that much higher in kerala in other words we really need to give a little bit more attention to vocational education vocational training and you know this problem that in a sense um, has has been bedeviling uh, kerala's higher education sector which is that increasing number of students on account of high rates of unemployment in the labor market uh, continue into higher education uh, 
for lack of doing anything else. Now, on the other hand, there is it's perfectly possible that there could occur a diversion of students at secondary and secondary and higher secondary uh, towards vocational education, towards vocational training, rather than allowing them to continue into art, science, commerce streams at the, at the tertiary education level. And this requires, of course, a, a visionary uh, policy decision. Now, of course, uh, expansion of vocational education training would require funds, and I think Dr. Isaac has already pointed to the difficulties there. But here, I, I'm reasonably confident that there is an opportunity here, because Precisely on account of the very high levels of education prevailing in Kerala, there will be plenty of modern services sector companies who would, would be willing to come in to do a certain amount of enterprise-based training. And the ASAP project has actually demonstrated that. Uh, so, for instance, um, Skilling has already is already beginning to show its its uh, value to the uh, Kerala economy because the ASAP project, I think there was a 2019 ADB study which compared ASAP uh, passouts with non-ASAP passouts who were similar in all other respects except that the ASAP passouts had much better employability skills. There was a 15 percentage point difference between them which is sort of statistically significant. So that should suggest that if we if we are, if the state is facing fiscal constraints, then it's perfectly possible to think of um, uh, industry being brought in. And I have more specific ideas about this, Dr. Isaac. I've written about this when I was in the planning commission, but I don't <coughs> think now is the time to talk about it. We can have a separate conversation uh, about this. But let me finish perhaps in, by making some very specific kinds of uh, suggestions, if I might. One is actually following up on what Dr. Isaac was saying about uh, nursing stuff. I mean, uh, clearly, uh, Dr. Isaac mentioned what, from 10,000, you want to go to 25,000. Um, it's not entirely clear that this is meant for Kerala's own needs. What we do know is that all of India will need many more paramedics many more nurses because the government, state governments of all states will actually probably up their expenditure on it and and there is a uh, there's, there's perhaps going to be a, a demand for Kerala nurses and paramedics as there always has been not just internationally but in the rest of the country uh, even more than ever before so in a sense you know perhaps please, please you may consider planning for that second concrete suggestion uh, which relates to, I think, uh, a finance minister's remittance concerns because returnees numbers is increasing. You know, rich countries which have a great elderly population with high, um, uh, a very high share of elderly, I'm thinking of Europe, Japan, Australia, North America, they are all in desperate need for elderly care. So if there was a focus on elderly care skilling, then these uh, uh, young sort of uh, paramedics um, on, on ordinary people who, who could be given uh, elderly care training with a certain amount of medical dimension uh, would be remittance earners as well as, you know, uh, solving the uh, unemployment problem. My third suggestion um, I, I don't know if I'm taking too long. I, 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 I do have three or four, two or three other suggestions very specific. Then, then we can come in the next round, sir? Or Absolutely. No, no, I, I, absolutely. No, no, I don't want to take more time than is uh, appropriate. Thank you, sir. We, we will uh, definitely come back to you. Uh, we also uh, have with us uh, uh, Dr. A.V. Joes, who worked as an ILO official at Bangkok, New Delhi, and at Geneva for nearly three decades. Currently, he's a senior consultant at the Gulati Institute of Finance and Taxation, Trivandrum. He's a member of the Standing Committee of Labor for Statistics, Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation of the Government of India, and an honorary visiting professor at the CDS uh, Trivandrum. So my question to you is, how do we prepare for the new world of work? Uh, broadly for three segments. First, 
the traditional and unorganized sector uh, whom we would could call uh, the uh, industry 3.0 factory workers and uh, the largely unskilled workers mm-hmm. the second segment is women uh, where you know kerala with uh, uh, self help groups like kudumbashri have done a great job and third uh, which is also the area that we have been discussing so far is the educated unemployed especially from the perspective of industry and the migration corridors that was referred to in the earlier conversation can i start yes doctor yes. okay um, thank you dr subhash um, and uh, it's a great opportunity that one can listen to old friends and um, and i really appreciate that statement made by dr thomas isaac that is going all out to finance the extension of improved facilities of education through purchasing financing the purchase of computers over 200000 of them through the kudumbashri institutions it's a it's a very commendable initiative which is bound to have far reaching um, impact on the skill acquisition process in kerala but then coming to the question you raised how are we going to deal with the changing world of work in relation to traditional industries in relation to the concerns of women and uh, the question of educated unemployment which is looming large when we say the traditional industries they have had a special place in kerala's history because of our inherent advantage for the growth of commercial crops a whole lot of traditional industries developed around the processing of our commercial crops and which is what gave us the kind of a head start which is what gave us a place in the value chains of the world which is also what strapped us in what is called the middle income trap unable to go beyond mobilize the kind of investable returns but then we paid a heavy price but then it had a positive side it enabled us to concentrate a lot more on social spending because we were catering to the requirements of all these industrial workforce which came into the processing industries but then let me not go into that right now the challenge is to modernize and technologically upgrade the traditional industries and there is no way we can escape that challenge and let's not pin our hope on the existing labor force they will indeed fade out of the labor force say in another 10 years of time what we need are modern industries based on the natural resources and that can ensure us the kind of a niche place in the global markets and that should be the kind of approach towards traditional industries but there are any number of ways of taking the labor force out of these industries and one can easily think of ways of pensioning the more field fertile for technological innovations so that the economy would move on to a higher growth trajectory which history has always taught us that the exigencies of the circumstances have prompted us to respond and create skills that are required for managing the kind of um, um, ex- the, the requirements made i mean what is called the kind of creative dis- destruction which is going on all around us has necessitated new skill formation and the conventional approach to human resource development planning that we can anticipate the skills and impart to them has never worked out in history on the other hand like dr isaac mentioned right now we should be in a position to train them very quickly to meet a rising demand for health professional which means the entire system of training should be geared to equipping the younger labor force or new entrants to the labor force with the kind of bare minimum requirements a kind of polyvalency of skills at the lowest at the at the at the bare minimum level which in turn can empower them enable them to navigate in the market 
acquire the necessary skills depending on the exigencies of circumstances. And that is precisely the question about women workers. We have an excess supply of them. We in fact have among the lowest worker participation rates in the whole of India. I mean, or rather let's say it's slightly marginally higher in the urban areas, something around 25% of women in the age group 15 plus who are there in the labor force willing to work, they just don't get work. It's not a supply side problem. It's essentially a demand side problem. And there the crucial challenge which is also linked to a problem of educated unemployment. By the way, as I think Dr. Santosh Merotra made it clear, we have a very high rate of unemployment in the among the educated categories. From secondary level onwards, our rate of unemployment tends to high rise, but it comes to the top. I mean, you know, uh, skill categories, it begins to fall. But then the fact of the matter is something like 23% of the women, 27% of the women workers in uh, entirely are unemployed, current rate of unemployment wise, and also among them with those with uh, secondary level schooling and above, it is 37%, the highest in the country, which means one has got to concentrate a great deal. But then here, the proposal I'm going to make might sound odd. We have got to deal with it from a demand side, which means one has got to make a concerted effort to make work more attractive. Work more attractive means we should or enhance the wages on offer and the terms and conditions of employment, which is the biggest challenge any developing country is facing. Making work attractive to those people who have decided, opted to stay out of the labor force, willing and available to work, but not actively looking for work. That's the kind of labor force we have in Kerala. And to bring them into paid employment, one has got to make a concerted effort to make work more attractive. That means we should be in a position to offer them better benefits from work. That means a decent retirement pension. It's not a tall order thing. Good healthcare facilities, all these can be incorporated into the package of rewards they get. Therefore, irrespective of the duration of work, irrespective of the nature of work, every person in the paid labor force, one way or the other, becomes entitled to that. And one can, the Kerala can certainly craft its institutional structures to meet this requirement. It requires a little bit of concerted thinking on the ways or the mechanics of doing that, but it's not an impossible goal. But then let me not go into the details. I suppose I'm well within my time, but if I have time, I can go ahead elaborating this question. How do we make work more attractive? That's that's, that requires a good deal of rethinking about meeting uh, employment requirements on the demand side of the labor market, making it possible for many more people to come, equipping them with the right kind of skill set. That's only part of the answer. But then more importantly, work should be made attractive to a lot of people who right currently decide to opt out of the labor market and there are far too many of them women and it's a colossal waste of precious human resources that we have decided to keep them out of the labor force one way or the other we should be able to inject them into the paid labor force and made part of that stream reducing income and wealth for the society thank you hello Ah, okay. <laughs> Why are you laughing at me? Or uh... no, 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 no. <laughs> no, no. I, I was thinking if I should debate with you <laughs> later. You, you better do that. <laughs> Nice to see you. I mean, you know, I'm glad that uh, that uh, your presentation was very impressive. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Subhash, uh, I don't think your connection is through. 
Hello. Sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, we can hear you. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I think by some accident the uh, sound got off. That's yeah. it. Uh, we have with us Mr. Vivek Abraham. He's the Vice President of Invest India, the National Investment Promotion and Facilitation Agency, in which the government has 49%, uh, and the rest equally divided among industry bodies like CII, FICCI, and NASCOM. Uh, prior to this, uh, Vivek has had stints at Lehman Brothers and SPA Capital Markets. As part of his work, Vivek advises uh, CXOs of American and European corporates and investors on their investments in India. He's also a consultant with the Kerala and Gujarat governments on their investment promotion efforts. Uh, he holds an MBA from the Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore. Uh, Vivek, my question to you is, how can we facilitate investments in Kerala in the priority sectors of the knowledge economy? Uh, the Chief Minister has been very eloquent about the areas where uh, investment can viably come in Kerala, looking at the uh, demographics, the quality of the workforce, the environment, for example, smart manufacturing, value-added uh, manufacturing, and other knowledge-intensive sectors like research, IT, and so on. Thank, thank you, Subhash. Uh, but before I answer the question, uh, just for uh, Dr. Isaac's uh, knowledge, uh, you, even Kerala holds a bit of a stake in Invest India. You hold 0.5% and you are very much a stakeholder in our organization. Um, so, sir, uh, just to address your question, uh, Subhash, I think we are, I, I have a very different perspective, uh, you know, listening to all of the feedback from various uh, consulting firms, various uh, CXOs across the globe. I don't think this is just a singular event. I think this is going to be a, a, a norm or a paradigm shift that we are seeing. And I think we need to react accordingly. I think we need to completely transform the way we do things, uh, especially in attracting investment or doing business or governing, um, or, you know, whatever that may be. Um, even if that were not true, even if COVID-19 is not going to be with us for a longer term, there may be other, other viral pandemics. Even if other viral pandemics do not come through, uh, there's always this fear perception at the back of your head that uh, it's going to come again and it's going to disrupt everybody's life, uh, everybody's lives. So what do we do? I think we have to view this, uh, you know, although this is an unprecedented crisis, but uh, at, at the edges of every crisis, there is an opportunity. And we are seeing an unprecedented flow of talent. I think all of that talent, which would have been lost to Kerala in the previous years, is now kind of coming back. And if you look at, uh, you know, I am from Lehman Brothers and I have lived through the global financial crisis, you know, firsthand. And one of the things that I saw was that banks really benefited from the talent that did not move around, that would usually move around. So now Kerala actually has that chance where this global world-class talent in all manner of uh, fields is actually coming back. And there is a real opportunity to revitalize some sectors of the economy which couldn't have been done before. And there is an example here. So if you look at China post SARS, it was at that point when the e-commerce economy suddenly picked up. Alibaba suddenly grew many fold post SARS because that's when they decided to pivot to an e-economy. But beyond that, uh, I think technology is going to be a pervasive element of everything that we see, everything that we do. If you look at all of the companies that really succeeded during the COVID crisis, COVID lockdown, it was all of those companies that had technology at the core of their business model. So if businesses going forward or governments going forward don't adopt technology as their core, I think uh, every step is just going to meet with uh, that much more resistance and it's going to be that much more difficult to implement. And health, health is also going to be a big priority. Uh, you know, everything now uh, said and done, if you don't have health, you lose uh, everything else. You lose income, companies don't have employees, there's no revenue, there's no demand. So health is going to be a priority and technology and health, if I must just uh, repeat that, are two areas where Kerala actually tops. You know, uh, Kerala has been one of the leading states in India, leading locations in the world 
actually where they've been promoting technology, where they've been promoting startups uh, for um, for the country. And health, uh, you know, not only from a traditional sense, although from a traditional sense, we've got Ayurveda and we've always had the traditional food aligned to our health. But even in the modern sense, we've been one of the leaders in medical talent and medical tourism uh, and, and nursing talent. So I think it's an opportune time for us to look at how we can do uh, business or how we can attract investment in a very different way. One of the things that we as a state really have is this the strength of the non-resident care alliance. I think we have we have utilized it to a certain extent, but I feel we can really utilize it. We can really maximize the strength that we have if we were able to point to different opportunities that the non-resident care alliance could pitch in with. I think case in point, uh, if you look at the Kuchin Airport. I think if you if you are able to bring together one unit or one one group of uh, people in the in the diaspora and point them out to different projects that need to be done, and everybody knows they are attached to their native places and villages, and there are obviously de developmental requirements and investment requirements in those areas as well. If one were to collate a list of such ideas and projects, I think they would receive a huge demand of capital. The second thing is, uh, you know, when, when we underwent the horrific floods a few years ago and how the entire diaspora just rose up together and nobody needed to say anything much. And I think we all raised that flag uh, without being asked to do anything. And uh, we contributed whatever we could to ensure that, uh, you know, from, from capital to technology to startups, everything came together around solving that problem. I think this is that moment as well. I think if you are able to point out what are the solutions that the government is willing to support and will, willing to facilitate from an end-to-end -end manner, uh, this would be a fairly capital efficient way of solving some of the problems. I think some of the specific ideas here right now, because globally talent is going to be short. Uh, you know, you've got all your engineering, medical, educational talent now coming back to Kerala. What are the rest of the world going to do? Can we enable them through a tech platform to deliver their skills and start new business models? Can we enable our small business owners to get uh, digital, uh, to be on a digital platform? We have so many uh, mom and pop stores in the tourism sector. Can we use this sector? Uh, can we use the tech platform to really leverage their revenues and look at doing business in a different way, in a more sustainable way? I think those are the elements which I would look at. And the last uh, point that I would leave with is Kerala has always been the leader in whatever they do, you know, whatever policy, whatever stance. I think that innovation element has always been unique to this state. Uh, and I think this is one thing that we should not forget. Whatever we do, we must set the standard. Thank you. Thank you, Vivek, uh, for that very upbeat view on uh, things and I think I think that is the way to uh, look at it because you know despair can be paralyzing. Uh, thank you. I uh, I'd like to go back uh, to Dr. Uh, Thomas Isaac. Uh, so you mentioned about the disruptive uh, technologies, uh, like they say in Hollywood. You know we ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, we are going to see even more disruptive technologies coming out of artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotics, and so on. Uh, we are seeing, you know, very well, we have seen very well-conceived policies and programs of the government not having the desired impact in implementation. Uh, one of the reasons uh, which some of the analysts say is about the administrative machinery, I'm coming back to the earlier point, the upskilling and empowering of the administrative machinery itself as a critical enabler, because while the government is trying to attract investment, increase the ease of doing business and uh, creating uh, or transforming Kerala into a, a human resource capital uh, for the world, uh, how would we, uh, how would you look at uh, transforming uh, the uh, modernization of the administrative machinery to enable this. Well, the 
whole computerization process in the government is moving at i think a fairly acceptable rate okay let me put it that way um in every every sector hmm? um but more than the technology what is lacking is the change in the mindset mindset um now for example of is functioning has changed uh, because computer is, has come in but everybody will stick on to the old norms of behavior how many people are required to do the job <laughs> what is your job criteria uh, use the computer but then you will stick to that uh, you have to accept that the whole the work process has changed and therefore the technology has changed and the whole work process will have to change and also then the work organization will have to change um, that's not uh, being accepted that's what i find um, otherwise you no know, i think it's a relatively rapid pace uh, changing the technology in the office etc is taking place but the organization to the work accordingly is very very slow there is a mismatch there uh, and that i think um, needs um, more intensive training and orientation yes. um is if you look at the as you go down the grassroots level this resistance increases that's what i feel uh, say if you take the secretariat it would be really better but if you go to the village office or below uh, you will find this kind of resistance um this is the mindset which is the the problem for example our state missionary is very good in say uh, having implementing welfare programs or implementing uh, social welfare programs like education health care and so on this run by government ministry but when it comes to say dealing with enterprise uh, the whole mindset is very different uh, that's not changing at all that is something i for the first time i have taken an administrative department and i find that uh, their mindset cannot be changed i mean they have to be uh, different attitude altogether that i think is what kerala lacks administration lacks when compared to say tamil nadu for example or gujarat everybody tells the attitude of the bureaucracy is very different and so more than the technology i think the attitude is a problem you have to consider so so what 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 do you think sir would be the 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 first few steps that the government could do to bring about that change is there a messaging going out uh, to to the society as such that there is a will uh, to change <laughs> if see i handle a administrative department small department quite a traditional industry and there have top to bottom effort has been in five years period change the technology thoroughly so now department so far they were all trying to regulate the corporate regulate the technology regulate the hus market <laughs> so change it into a development department uh, so i think this no shortcut to me i have written <coughs> one full fledged book so that because i instead <laughs> of speaking yes speaking okay uh, i think i would have spent at least 6 um, 7 uh, days with the officers full time sitting with them talking talking um see then there is change taking place i can sense that Uh, now i don't have to think there are officers who think for example i'll tell you one instance hold exports have been disrupted we are stuck with huge some 40 50 crores of stocks 
which we have to keep on buying because producers otherwise they get rusted. So now some of the officers are working on COVID map. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Here is a market opportunity. So they have Googled upon and taken uh, Sani Stride. Now that is synthetic. So we are talking with um, this um, uh, medical devices center. For one and a half months, two months, a bunch of people have been working on this. I wouldn't have expected this, say, two years back. Uh, two years back. Yes. Uh, so there are changes taking place, and there's no shortcut to it. I think in Kerala, it's not possible to order things around. You issue an order, and yes. there are subterraneous <laughs> ways of getting around. Yes. So I think we have to keep the conversation going, talking, going. talking, talking. Thank you, sir. Uh, that is, that is, uh, you know, very. Uh, well put uh, about the uh, mindset change that is going to be there. Uh, Professor Merotra, uh, you know, we had to stop you uh, mid-way uh, through your answer about, uh, you know, the point, the, the uh, few points you had about, you know, specifically what Kerala can do. Uh, in addition to that, uh, one more uh, question, uh, you know, after you complete that, uh, how can we promote growth in the priority sectors in Kenya, in your view, from your experience uh, uh, in other parts of the country and other parts of the world? Uh, the, the priority sectors in Kerala have been uh, well identified, well documented. It's been also referred to here. How would you approach promoting growth in the priority sectors in Kerala? So let me pick up on, on, on that. Uh, before I return to some more specific suggestions. So, um, given that the priority sectors have been identified, they are obviously going to be in the modern services sectors, they will, they're obviously going to be in the knowledge economy sectors. Uh, one could well, I mean, Kerala could well think about focusing on, on, on uh, securing technical assistance for enabling uh, for an enabling framework for a startup ecosystem i'm sure that there is, there is a thriving ecosystem already in place but perhaps more could be done with the help of nri malayali in terms of human resources and also if i might add in terms of venture capital support from nri malayali uh, with perhaps skills Skill support coming from an organization like the Asian Development Bank. I mean, I, I say this because of the following. You know, you know, most of the startup venture capital companies in India happen to be Chinese owned. And I find this utterly uh, not only startling but uh, worrying. I mean, the startups that became unicorns in India, the Oyos, the Baijus, the Zomatos, the Big Baskets you know, all have massive shareholdings from Chinese. Why is it that we cannot have NRI, um, particularly Malayari NRIs, who could come in with venture capital support for startups in the knowledge economy, in modern services, um, and, and uh, ecosystem could, in fact, enable them to do that. And perhaps, uh, you know, Vivek can uh, help uh, the government of Kerala work on this. You know, I, let me go back to um, a concern that was that Dr. both Dr. Isaac raised as well as Dr. Joe's raised about you know, the, the shortage of government finance. And uh, Dr. Joe's raised the point about you know demand, general aggregate demand being low, and therefore jobs jobs themselves are actually low. Let me come at this in, from a slightly different perspective. Dr. Isaac, what we know is that the global experience is that wherever employers and industry itself drive skill development programs, and there the effectiveness of those programs and the employability of the, of the training uh, is much higher. 
And in fact, the employment prospects are much higher because the employers know exactly what kind of skills they are looking for. So, you know, what is this? You know, COVID is the pandemic is a, is an opportunity because if we continue with a with a India-wide model in Kerala also, government-driven, government-managed, government-financed, uh, uh, technical and vocational education training institutions. Uh, there, the issues with employability of these uh, of the graduates from your government-run institutions will continue to be uh, it will continue. And we we know that you know industry can actually and employers can be incentivized to come in to help in the process of curriculum design for training, to provide internships for, for, tra for training, to come in to do the actual assessment and do placement counseling for training institutions because they obviously know, you know what kind of skills would work, what are the genuine employability skills. So, you know, it would be, this is a great opportunity to bring industry in. Now, I, I say this also because, you know, your uh, cluster skills part, the CSPs, which have been financed by the Asian Development Bank loan, of which now you already have 16, uh, and they have been now in operation for one year. Large companies have been providing trainers, and there's, there is, Serious industry engagement taking place and PPP arrangements have been designed to <coughs> outsource operation and maintenance of these cluster skills, skills parks to private private operators. So it's this model which should um, you know enhance employability. And I'll close with the following point, if I may, that the evidence that seems to have been emerging from your six years of experience of the ADB loan in the skills space is that there is a strong case to be made for its extension for uh, another five year period. Now, uh, because what we are, the sense I'm getting is that, you know, the ADB support has actually deepened this industry engagement. Now, I understand that the government of Kerala may have hit a 2% of GSTP limit in respect of foreign loan access. But I also understand that, and I may, I'm of course open to correction, uh, Dr. Isaac, that post pandemic, the government of Israel has actually enhanced the possibility of, of enhanced borrowing on behalf of the state of Kerala to 5% of GSP. Uh, so I, I would strongly argue that the government of Kerala should utilize this possibility for extending the ADB loan in, in the area of skill development, given that it is really showing promise in terms of employability thank you thank you uh professor uh, professor Merutra. that was uh, i think uh, made uh, made it very clear uh, your views on how to uh, develop uh, the uh, growth in the priority sectors uh, dr jose uh, connecting with what uh, has been discussed so far uh, how do you feel private sector can be co-opted into the government initiatives on skilling and employability? Uh, what I mean is, for example, in a state like Kerala, as uh, Professor Merodra pointed out, uh, seven out of 10 new jobs for the educated are in the services sectors, like BFSI, retail, hospitality, logistics, healthcare, and so on. Uh, despite that, there still doesn't seem to be a, a formal or even an informal structured system of easy access between job seekers and employers. I think while we have technologies happening in and advancing in many areas, uh, this particular critical gap still seems to be not filled between uh, job seekers and employers in a state like Kerala, especially for the services sector where there, there are issues of high attrition, churn, and so on. So how would you uh, address that issue? At the level of skills prevalent in the state, I'm not worried about the kind of gaps or the missing links, because in so far as I can see, the technology 
institutes, the ITIs, right, of Kerala. They've done a tremendous job, a terrific job, by way of equipping an entire generation of youngsters to move up the value chain, position themselves at vantage points, and sell their labor power critically important labor power in different parts of the world. I'm not worried about our inability to meet the skill requirements at any time. But then there's something I'm really worried about. That is our lethargy when it comes to picking up the frontiers of knowledge. We might have a very disdainful attitude towards our university professionals, but then the fact remains they are still the assets we have to work with. And that's the only way we can make any progress towards the, the frontiers of science and technology in, in a whole variety of new disciplines, gene therapy, um, information technology, artificial intelligence, all these things are beyond reach for us seemingly because we haven't made even a modicum of effort towards revitalizing our R&D efforts. And that can certainly be done in collaboration with the private sector to the extent it is possible. Let me tell you, 30 years ago, I've been to China on a number of occasions. It was very much a bicycle riders economy. The 30 years there has been the kind of quantum leap which put China as one among the real superpowers of the world on the science and technology front. It was investment in at home with the kind of same scornful teachers and professionals which we are towards our fellow beings. I mean, so did I have the same attitude towards Chinese professionals 30 years ago, but then they have made this kind of giant strides because the state stood with them, collaborated with the crucial actors, social partners, the key actors on in the educational avenue to make it possible for them to come up with the kind of solutions on science and technology front. And I think there is abundant scope for us to collaborate with the private sector. But let's, for a moment, set aside the question, we are responding to skill requirements. The skill requirements, we have sufficient manpower. I still would stick to this notion that we have done well on that front. And we have been exemplary, we have seen exemplary performance of our education sector, of our health sector, when it meets, comes to meeting the health requirements of ordinary people. We have done a good job, but it's time we moved ahead. We established our own ventures for pharmaceutical concerns, oncology parks, name any one where we ought to be there in the front front. And we ought to be there doing a lot more of structured analysis of big data. Big data analytics, I know is a dirty word in Kerala, but I think it's set aside these silly notions about using precious data to gain insights into the social behavior of people, the kind of advancements that we can make on that front with the expansion of markets, all these are within reach. If only we start R&D investment with our knowledge centers, however primitive we think they are, we have got to start at the beginning. We have got to invest in them and make progress in that direction. And we have a surfeit of such institutes which can be turned into good quality ones eventually. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, Vivek, uh, uh, coming back to you, uh, in, a, in one of the earlier discussions we had as part of the series, uh, there was a mention about uh, uh, the Malayali having the migration DNA. Uh, you know, it was said that, you know, whichever part of the world you go, you will find a care life, uh, something or the other. Now, how can we transform Kerala to the human resource capital of the world? How do we prepare the current youngsters here to prepare you know, for the emerging world? And is there any way that we can uh, connect the dots by linking investments coming into Kerala with the skilling ecosystem? Uh, what I, uh, for example, uh, we have, uh, I, I've seen in 
Karnataka, where uh, Mercedes Benz, they have associations with a few colleges where they uh, set up laboratories, uh, they identify people who are passionate about uh, automobiles, uh, take them as interns, and then they do projects, and then finally uh, get a career there. Would something like that, where uh, the investment and skilling ecosystem be possible in a place like it? Absolutely. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, we have one of the most, uh, uh, you know, one of the most talented uh, pool of skills that we have uh, in, in the country and probably in the world. And, and, and uh, you don't have to look very far. I think some of the global CEOs or global technologists all come from here. I think, but you know, more more than skilling, uh, I think what we are really looking for is demand for that skill. Yes, um, and and that is the key problem here. And among various states in the country, I think Kerala stands out because they know exactly, or we know exactly where we are strong. We know our strengths very well. In fact, we have sharpened it so much that we know the exact projects in which we want investment. We know exactly how much it will take and what kind of investors we want to attract. The problem lies in that these investors or, or potential targets that uh, we want people, uh, we want them in Kerala, uh, probably are not aware of Kerala as an investment destination and, and or, or not really aware that Kerala has this pool of talent or school, uh, sorry, skill uh, that uh, could be useful to them. And therein, uh, I feel that a very strong program of engagement uh, and, and this is a great start. I think we should have, uh, Kerala government should have more and more engagement with more stakeholders like this and get more ideas, but not only to get ideas, but to promote the idea of Kerala, the idea of investing in Kerala, the idea of working with the talent in Kerala and, and create brand ambassadors. I, you know, if Kerala doesn't have one already, I think it should have a standing industry council where it quickly takes feedback on various policies various ideas and various, I mean, questions that you're asking me, Subhash, I think that should be a, a normal course of the uh, action where this industry council should be asked to give feedback on how it should be executed. Uh, media should be engaged in a huge way. I think one place that we really, as a country, lack is uh, the power of media and soft influence. And if you pick up any global business newspaper, be it Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, you can have about 10 to 12 mentions of China, but hardly one mention of India and that too when there's a negative uh, news. I think one great uh, win success that we had as a country was when the health minister of the state was profiled by the Guardian. And you know the success of the health model of Kerala was really brought out. And that's when people started talking about, yes, you know, India also has an amazing model or amazing uh, pool of talent that can be really used. And it's these elements, I believe, if we continuously engage, continuously hammer this message across the world, uh, you know, I think we'll get to much more than where we are. And we already have the network to do it, you know, so non-resident Keralites, uh, you know, there are any number of associations. You don't have to tell them much. You don't have to pay them much. In fact, not pay them at all. They will do whatever they need to do to promote the state of Kerala. And we just need to provide them the messaging. We just need to tell them that this is the message that needs to go out there. These are the people that we need to reach. And there will be a connect and there'll be, uh, uh, you know, that, that message brought through. And beyond that, there are, you know, because we have these really finely honed strengths or projects or places where we want investment, we also know which countries these uh, investments or a possible demand for skill or talent will come from. We need to have an active bilateral engagement with those countries on a on a half yearly basis or on a yearly basis. With that the government, we must start this kind of conversations. Many other states are doing it. For example, uh, Haryana has with Japan, Gujarat has with Korea, Andhra Pradesh also has with Korea. And these are countries where uh, these states have identified that there are certain sectors that they would like to bring to the state. Likewise, Kerala can, you know, first and foremost, have a formal bilateral engagement with the whole of Italy. That's where the strength is. Then move on to other parts of the world like Japan, Europe and US, especially, you know, mapping out several sectors where they are strong in. I think if we have a specific engagement plan, if we know where exactly this demand is going to come from, I think it's telling them that this is there available for them. 
the strengths and the, the the help and the support in the platform that is available that itself will solve a lot of the issues thank you uh, thank you vivek that was uh, very well articulated and uh, very clearly uh, spelled out uh, we'll uh, take a few questions from the uh, uh, audience which's been coming in uh, there is one uh, question addressed to the uh, honorable minister uh, dr thomas i said this is a question from uh, professor sabu padmadas of the university of southampton uh, his question is what are the initiatives that the government has started to attract business investment in the state is there any sectoral focus and what are the measures in place to sustain those initiatives <clears throat> Now the pandemic has brought a lot of international attention to Kerala. We are aware of that, and that we would like to build on that. Um, say, make Kerala attractive investment place uh, because it's a safe place. Okay, that can be one added uh, brand image that Kerala can have, and we would. put as priority areas on health related sectors uh, to it because after a long time the last two years there have been at least uh, more than one dozen major uh, let me put new growth nothing great but you should have been there yeah, very impressive in fact i started my budget speech narrating all of them numbering or listing out all of them um i think that definitely is an area because a whole lot of disruptive technologies are going to come in the post pandemic world it should have a lot of it content and therefore kerala should attempt to slip into that niche if possible um then value additions in the agro processing industries transforming them uh, these are broadly areas priority areas kerala has uh, identified knowledge based industries skill based industries and service based industries put it simply and the initiatives include let me say a point which has not been discussed here i think post pandemic in kerala there will be lot of changes fundamental change is going to take place in the higher education in terms of investment as well as certain policy orientation um, i think cm has already hinted it yes. floated some ideas floaters yes i i think it's very important he has not caught the attention of the media and so on but he has already done that because uh, you cannot uh, Think, aspire to be a knowledge economy without doing something serious with your higher education. Very clear. Um, that's one. Second, there has been references to uh, say utilizing the talent savings, etc., migrant return migrants into Kerala. Well, see, with an institution such as KIFI. Our government finance is very tough. <clears throat> okay, we get five percent more, two percent more GDP for borrowing. It means eighteen thousand crores rupees, but your revenues are going to fall by thirty-five thousand crores rupees. So <laughs> it doesn't solve any problem of mine. But outside the budget, if we expanding it a bit further, I think we can think of a vast um, industrial estate program. Not be concentrated one big thing, but Kerala is not a big state after all. Therefore, I say a thousand points, some fire curtain neck of plots, uh, which will be the owned by the Gulf Retreni. All of them would have invested something in land, but it can be monetized with the help of Kifi, which could be the we can think of a model like that, uh, something very bold and big. to attract uh, private investment from the returned migrants into kerala um and i think following the uh, suggestions that were raised this 
in this discussion. Uh, Kerala should welcome industrial uh, corporations and so on to set up their training institutes and research institutes and let's say engineering uh, platforms in Kerala itself to engage them. While liberal arts and science colleges, etc., would remain in the broad state policy that Kerala has been pursuing in terms of technology, we should be willing to open up in a bigger way than we are doing now. Thank you, sir. We are, I think, coming to the close. I think there is one more question that was uh, addressed to Vivek from, uh, uh, yeah. So this is about, uh, in your opinion, what are the key obstacles that you have found in bringing investments to a state like Kerala, being, being in that business? I, I think, uh, you know, one, one I've already addressed, one was the perception challenge. Uh, and I think uh, we at Invest India are trying to do a bit to position the strengths over uh, the challenges that the state faces um, and and Kerala is uniquely suited to several in industries which are not suited for other states so uh, primarily tech innovation startups uh, given that there's one internet uh, uh, cable that is landing at Kochi uh, I think that's a huge strength which not, not a lot of people know uh, but the other thing uh, I think uh, you know the traditional industries of manufacturing and infrastructure I think that has uh, suffered mainly because of the lack of land. I think there is uh, pockets of land available for uh, certain sectors like food processing, uh, chemicals near the Cochin port and, and certain earmarked areas for infrastructure. But that has been the key obstacle. But I, I think that's not really an obstacle given that the focus sectors for Kerala is, is completely different. And I think we should not be swayed by what other thing others think is important for our state. I think we know what we are, we are good at, and and we should stick by that. Thank you, uh, thank you, Vivek. Uh, it was a a, a wonderful and uh, insightful uh, session. So before I uh, get into summarizing the key points discussed. Uh, a big thank you to Dr. Thomas Isaac for staying the full length of the uh, discussion. Uh, it reflects uh, his personal commitment and I think also the commitment of the governments to uh, discourses of ideas that can help uh, take the state forward and uh, that openness we greatly appreciate, sir. Uh, in his uh, interventions, uh, Dr. Thomas Isaac uh, spoke about how the state GDP is shrinking by 15% and how there is a, a revenue gap of 35,000 crores that needs to be bridged, the need for MSME support, and the, and the large scale, uh, you know, expected to be around 5 lakh return migration. Now, this is a kind of a problem statement that we had. And also, he touched upon, in response to the question, about the significant redeployment of government employees uh, that is required in the health sector, in the local government, and the need for reforms uh, in the higher education, which he again touched upon. In fact, I had also watched uh, the chief minister's uh, one discussion yesterday where he spoke about that you know that is something and i think that is very far-sighted because i think when we go to a root cause of a situation i think higher education uh, is very prominent in uh, most analysis of the problems that we have uh, the minister also spoke about uh, given the constraints of the fiscal framework how he needs to look outside the budget uh, for bridging the gap including kfb kfc uh, Kerala Bank, and also felt that more than technology, it is the mindset and the resistance to change in various sectors, which uh, progressively in his uh, experience increases as you go to the grassroots level from the secretariat, which needs to be addressed. Also, in response to a question, uh, as an investment destination, 
uh, of Kerala, uh, the positioning or branding, safe destination, I think, will carry a lot of weightage. Uh, and the priority would be health, IT, agro processing. And to do something big and bold in attracting uh, private investment. Professor Merutra, uh, with all the data on his uh, fingertips uh, and with all his erudition, he spoke about how the, the unemployment percentages in Kerala are higher than the uh, rest of the country, especially in the 15 to 29 uh, age group, that is the youth employment, uh, in the educated youth employment sector. We are almost at twice the national level for unemployment, and that's a huge area of concern. He sp spoke about how mainstream arts and commerce uh, streams of higher education have uh, very little employability skills uh, built into them and uh, sp spoke about the need to emphasize on vocational uh, training and, the, and preparing the youngsters for opportunities in the modern uh, services industry. Uh, he also pointed out uh, a great success story we have. Uh, with ASAP, where uh, there is a research finding that the ASAP passouts have a 15% uh, higher employability than a non ASAP passout, which is, I think, uh, uh, a terrific endorsement for the work that uh, ASAP is uh, doing. And uh, of course, uh, he also uh, mentioned upon, uh, you know, which the minister also mentioned about. The opportunity for nursing, where from about 10k to 25k, we can uh, look at training, and also the uh, taking advantage of the demography of the developing uh, countries like Europe, and North America, and Japan, where rich elderly population require that elderly care, and Kerala could be uh, a major source of that talent. Dr. Jose. Uh, uh, was very passionate uh, in, in, a, in a key point, which actually comes up very few uh, in discourses, but I think it's, it's a very important uh, dimension of this entire employability skilling uh, discourse about attracting, the, about making the jobs attractive. So of attract, making uh, the conditions of work more attractive so that people outside the workforce are attracted back into it. He also spoke about the traditional industries, special place in Kerala, and how modernization and uh, technical upgradation is a, is a necessity. And uh, he emphasized again that the challenge is really not on the supply side, it is on the uh, demand side uh, in terms of uh, the traditional workforce as well as women. He's, he, uh, stated that 37% of the educated women in Kerala are not in the workforce, which means we have, as, a, as, a, as an industry or as an economy, failed in creating those opportunities for this talent. And it's a colossal waste to have this uh, so much of talented workforce staying at home simply because there is not enough attractive jobs. Uh, ITIs have done a, a, a great job. Uh, Dr. Jose also touched upon the uh, lethargy that we have in terms of higher learning and not putting in that effort to get into the cutting edge of learning like areas like big data, gene therapy, pharma, and research and R&D in general. Uh, Vivek started off by saying that COVID is not uh, it's a paradigm shift and there could be other pand pandemics, other uh, disruptive things happening in the world. However, uh, he was very upbeat and he was focusing on the silver linings, which I think is really the need of the hour. So he looked at this whole reverse migration, which everyone, uh, most people are looking at as a problem, as talent coming back. Uh, it's a real opportunity, and I think it's, it's a great point, a real opportunity to revitalize many sectors in Kerala, looking at, you know, uh, leveraging on the strength of the NRIs. And he spoke about how uh, post-SARS China, 
how e-commerce uh, really went on to boom and Alibaba became uh, what they are, and how technology has now become pervasive in business and government. And if you look at health and technology, these are two areas where Kerala has strengths. Uh, and then you also spoke about how, uh, like the Cochin Airport model, uh, you know, the diaspora's uh, heartstrings are uh, very powerfully attached to the state and how that can be uh, leveraged uh, to be the brand ambassadors for Kerala. And you just need to give them the message and they will uh, uh, put that uh, message. And also uh, touch upon, I think this is a very key point about the need for engagement with media and how as a state, I think this is a great opportunity. We have got some natural traction here with the, the tremendous work that we've done uh, in the last uh, two months. We are the group world is watching us. So leveraging on that, you know, have a sustain, sustained uh, media campaign and uh, win the battle of uh, perception. So with that, I think we have come to the end of our allocated time. Uh, thank you everyone once again for the uh, wonderful discussion, the erudite uh, insights and thanks once again. We understand uh, Dr. Thomas Isaac, your schedules, uh, the challenges that you have, but the fact that you spent uh, over an hour and a half with us and participated, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Miran. Thank you. Thank, and, you. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Dr. Jus. Thanks a lot, Vivek. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, viewers. Uh, yeah. I hope you had a wonderful uh, evening and good night.